everyone. I'm James Milan, and welcome to this episode of Million Dollar Gift, our series that focuses on the incalculable value, really. We say million dollars, but it could be much more than that, of volunteer energy uh, in our community and of the organizations and, uh, and other services that really rely <clears throat> on people donating their time and energy. Um, one of the absolute flagship services uh, for that here in Arlington and a very familiar uh, treasure of our community is Foodlink. And today I am joined by both Deanne DuPont, who is one of the two founders of Foodlink, and its program manager, Elise Springle. So thank you both of you for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, and I say here, but of course, all of us here together virtually and in mm -hmm. our separate and safe spaces. Um, I wanted to basically, I think much of our audience is going to be familiar already uh, with what Foodlink is and the work that you guys do. But Deanne, maybe you can just give us a pretty quick uh, synopsis of <clears throat> where Foodlink came from and what it is that you guys are all about. So where Foodlink uh, came from is <clears throat> when the other co-founder, Julie Kremer, noticed that one of the local bakeries was throwing away their bread each night to make room for their fresh baked bread the next morning. And she thought, well, that food could be collected and distributed to people in need. And it started there and she asked me to join this effort and I did. And then the next thing we knew, we were collecting food, uh, baked goods from several bakeries and within about four months, we started working with Trader Joe's to collect other food, including perishable food, uh, fresh produce, meat, and those sorts of things. And that was uh, eight years ago. And where we are now is we have six employees. We have our own cargo van. We work with well over 20 or 25 donor agencies under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. And we have approximately 50 recipient agencies and we're in 20 communities. That is, well, <clears throat> it's impressive. Um, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Um, I, you know, I've talked to you about this a number of times um, and I'm really familiar with the history of Foodlink, of course, and I'm proud to have been you know, part of it from from close to the beginning. Um, but surprisingly, I don't think I've ever asked you, um, how hard was it initially to get, you know, Trader Joe's and Panera and Whole Foods, wh wherever it is that you got that started those, um, you know, that, that flow going, how hard was it to, to convince uh, these companies to, to jump on board with this? Well, it was interesting. Trader Joe's reached out to us when they heard what we were doing. They reached out to us, and then once you 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 build on your reputation, and then from there we added Whole Foods. One of our volunteers connected us with Russo's, and then we were doing a good job at Whole Foods Arlington. So then we were asked to do Whole Foods Medford, and then it just keeps growing. Up a good bit on your reputation that you you show up when you say you will and then you you handle the food properly once you receive it until it gets all the way to the distribution to programs and agencies serving people in need. And Elise, how much of the work that you do as program manager right now um, involves you know the relations with your food suppliers and you know finding new ones or or you know establishing new new connections in that way? Yeah, that's a, a large portion of what we do. Um, we've been figuring out in the last few months on how we're going to ramp up our operations when we move to 108 Summer Street. So a lot of it's been kind of the initial groundwork. We have a strong relationship with the Greater Boston Food Bank, um, who um, often acts as like a point person because many of the larger um, chain, grocery chains and uh, organizations contact them first. So we, um, they funnel folks to us, which works really well. But this is always kind of a balancing act of both 
taking on new food donors while also taking on new recipient agencies because we always want to have um, just a little more food than we can regularly give out so everyone gets enough um, and then we have a couple access places that we can push what's left. Um, so it's always this balancing act. Yeah, how does, how does that go? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> how, how, how can you tell? How, how do you know? Are you just making your best guess or what? Uh, you know, it's a little bit of a nuanced thing of being um, around our food every day. You know, it'll be a Tuesday and go, oh, you know, we had a lot today. I'm going to see if next week we still have excess that we're pushing to the next day. And then I'm going to call this place that's on our wait list. Um, or we have a number of kind of one-time places or places that are kind of waiting in the wings. So we'll we'll call them up when we have excess. And if it's a consistent thing that every every Wednesday they're getting a call, then it becomes something regular. No, um, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, right? People would, or <clears throat> recipients, uh, recipient agencies or whatever would kind of start by getting on a wait list or, or taking things when you have enough. And then eventually just seeing if organically that can get to be a regular thing. That, yeah. I'd like to add too, with the partnership with the Greater Boston Food Bank, they they understand organizations like us do food rescue very well because it's usually collect and deliver the same day, whereas the Greater Boston Food Bank will admit that's not where their um, their expertise lies because there's always an extra day lag before the food can get to agencies. Mm -hmm. So the partnership is quite strong because they really support and want us to do what we're doing in order to get the food out quicker to programs. Right, I would think that even if they, you know, their own existence is as a kind of intermediary or middle middleman between, you know, the 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 uh, donate the donors and the recipients, um, they'd rather, you know, because mm -hmm. it's their mission. Uh, I'm sure they would rather have a you know promote a model and support a model like yours which is which cuts that out and just mm -hmm. kind of gets things operating much more efficiently um so um in general uh just tell us uh you know again pretty briefly how does how do things work for food link normally um are you getting for instance just pick any of your um uh, any of your donors and just tell us how it would work on any given day um, getting and then distributing to any of your recipients. So let's say we're working with Whole Foods on a particular day and generally we would have two collections, one at 10 from Whole Foods Medford and one at noon from Whole Foods Arlington. And the volunteer team that shows up at Whole Foods Medford knows where it's going to for the most part. And they will collect the food, sort it. And by sorting, they're sorting to get some of the, to get the bad food out by bad. It could be a, a moldy lemon or a very bruised apple so that what we distribute is the nicer and intact fruit and veggies and, and that sort of thing. We also checking it for food safety. Um, and so then we, from there, will generally from um, Whole Foods Medford, we would have a delivery perhaps to Bunker Hill Community College, perhaps one to Medford Senior Center, one to the Mystic Community Market and the Arlington Boys and Girls Club, Fidelity House. There's probably about six or seven distributions from Whole Foods Medford. And then anything that's not distributed and our volunteers will pack it in their cars and they're usually at their destination within 15 minutes so that the food is staying in the safe zone during that period. And then the van will then go to Whole Foods Arlington and repeat what we did at Whole Foods Medford and then deliver it to the various organizations. Some places get more than one delivery in a day as well depending upon what's going on and what you've received for, for that. Mm -hmm. And Elise, are there any foods, types of food that you are particularly looking for at any given time or um, also that you absolutely, you know, are not going to take? 
Um, I mean, really, the only thing we don't take is food that um, is not safe to be giving out. Um, uh, but even, you know, we'll get some things that are just like a little too bruised to feel that we don't feel like we can give to our recipient agencies, but our volunteers take those home um, and are happy to make applesauce and things like that. Uh, but we particularly like dealing with um, fresher foods, fresh produce, dairy, meats, um, because those are the foods that many of these um, agencies have um, gone toward giving out because they are the healthier foods. Um, we get a lot of bread and baked goods as well, and everyone's always happy to get a nice cake from Whole Foods, um, and we're excited to give those out in our own ways, but our preference is to go for the um, fresh and healthy foods. And are there recipient agencies that are really, or, or recipients that are, that are really only either interested in or can only accept because of who they are, certain kinds of food? Yeah, um, we work really hard to tailor the deliveries to the needs of the agency. So for example, we work with some agencies that have no refrigeration um, available for storage. So we might be tailoring the delivery to be things that can be held at room temperature, like, um, fruit vegetables or non-perishables, um, or we might be delivering kind of um, the moment before their distribution happens so that we can bring some refrigerated items for them. Uh, we also are often talking to agencies about getting culturally appropriate foods. Um, Arlington Eats Market, for example, has a, a large portion of, um, of cu customers who are Asian and um, being able to give them something like bok choy really makes folks stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think that one of the things that we um, have, have, are managing to accomplish in this conversation is giving people a better sense of, um, I, again, I mentioned at the outset that everybody's familiar with Foodlink, and I really think that's true. And they know, in a general sense, they could give a one sentence description of what you guys are doing. Um, but I think what's being, what, what I'm even finding out for myself here is, just how many things you have to take into account um, and how many complicating factors there are in what, um, in what it is that you guys are doing on a daily basis. Um, how far, um, you know, Deanne, you were mentioning that you're working in, uh, would you say, I think you said 20 communities. How, how far is the geographical scope? Is your geographical reach? So we deliver as far, far north as Lowell and Lawrence. And then we do work with a program in South Boston that collects from us, so they come to us. And we do have a program in Attleboro, Attleboro that come to us for the, the food, because we that's beyond our general distribution area. And we go, we don't go that much, much further west, but in Waltham and uh, Lexington, is what we do on the, the western side so we're fairly broad range yeah i mean it sounds like you guys are really operating within the far stretches in a lot of ways of the boston metropolitan area or what we would think of that way yeah um, but not for instance western mass or you know into other parts of new england or anything like that yet that, that is correct i shouldn't say yet i you know. <laughs> <laughs> um so i want to segue i want to bring us uh a closer now I think people have a sense of of, of how things operate normally um, of course nothing is normal um, at the moment as everybody is well aware um, so what I'd like to do is find out from you you know what are the biggest changes that you have that you know the biggest impact that the pandemic has had on your operations and also get your own sense of we've had the privilege of speaking recently to uh, folks from Project Bread, from Arlington Eats, from the Council on Aging. We know that there's a lot of collaboration going on here in town in order to provide food and other kinds of services and needs uh, to vulnerable populations in Arlington and beyond. And we know that you guys are playing a big part. So feel free to tackle this from any angle you want. But, you know, what are the impacts on you guys um, and, and how you do things and also what is the nature of the collaborating that you're doing with other agencies? Sure. Um, so yeah, as you said, this has affected everything. Um, the COVID-19 outbreak has um, most certainly 
affect it the ways we are working. Um, we are still doing our, our basic mission of rescuing food and nourishing community, or at least our tagline of doing that. Um, but uh, it has affected, as I was talking before, talking about kind of that balancing act that we have of having enough food and enough agencies, it's affected both sides of that scale. So um, we've seen our food supply kind of do this like wave motion throughout this where, um, you know, when the grocery stores started selling out, our donations went way down. And then when the schools and restaurants closed, we got an influx of donations from them and they went way up. So when we were looking back at March, we actually discovered that if we look at our regular set of um, pickups in March, it was our smallest month in two years. But if you take it as a whole and include all these one-time donations or um, new donors that we are getting working with um, wholesale distributors, uh, restaurants and schools, as I mentioned, um, and other places, it was our largest month ever. Uh, so on that end, things have changed. And then on the other end, the places we take food has changed. DM was mentioning before places like the Medford Senior Center or the Arlington Boys and Girls Club. Both of those agencies are closed due to the virus. Uh, while many of the food pantries we work with have um, upped the ante and are doing more than ever, and new food pantries that we've never worked with are looking for more food. Um, we're also doing work with uh, grassroots organizations, places that are less formal than we've worked with in the past, um, that are doing great jobs of just getting food to folks with mutual aid organizations. Um, so those are some of the things, um, but then the, the kind of third piece is that food insecurity is expanding in Massachusetts. Uh, Project Bread reported this past week that it's up to 38% of the population, right. and it's normally 9%. So that is a significant increase in a small period of time, and it's not something that will just change when the stay-at-home order uh -huh. is lifted. Yeah, and what I'm sure you have also noted some things, Deanne, yeah? Yeah. So, so one of the things too is we're trying to do what we're doing. Uh, our throughput has increased about 75% or so. And we're trying to do this with social distancing and we reduce the number of volunteers in order to ensure more social distancing. So we've been working extremely hard to get the food so that it doesn't get wasted and then getting it to organizations serving people in need. So if you think about you know, expanding by 75%, literally overnight, the throughput of food, reducing the number of volunteers, people and incorporating social distancing and cleaning our facility several times a day, it's become a, a, a big project and process to do this, but we've managed it successfully which we always called ourselves nimble. And I think we're demonstrating that nimbleness during this, this period, during this crisis. Oh boy, I, I think nimble is a fabulous word to describe, um, you know, both the organization and what is required uh, mm -hmm. right now, because uh, as, as Elise was already outlining that, I'm sure it was a dramatic kind of uh, flow and ebb um, you know, throughout March, and those just, just that that combination of you know smallest number and largest number in the same space of time is uh, you know that's crazy. So um, I know also though that uh, in talking to the Arlington Eats um, organization recently, um, they of course switched their model so that they're doing all home delivery, and that and they also have fewer volunteers because of the nature of maintaining everybody's safety and health and safety. Um, how, how is it working for you guys? Are, are the volunteers that you have taking more shifts, basically? Um, how, how are you managing to thread that needle? Yeah, um, so part of what we've done is we've instituted a cohort model um, for our staff and volunteers. So we have um, three distinct teams uh, that we named after vegetables because that's what we do. Um, so we have team carrot, banana, and apple. Uh, avocado. Goodness, I should know my teams. <laughs> avocado, banana, and carrot. Um, but uh, each volunteer is assigned to a team. 
um, and there are certain days of the week each team has so that we don't have um, kind of cross-contamination in case mm -hmm. um, one team there is any infection on. But we've reduced the number of volunteers on each of our shifts. Uh, we used to have some very large shifts that were, had six or seven people doing them and now we, we do it with about three. Uh, this is okay in the ways that, as I mentioned, the donations from our um, from our grocery stores are down and those take those are um, take more sorting uh, and because we have we tend to be now working with agencies that are doing larger volume instead of sorting for six locations we're sorting for one or two um, so that's been able to help us streamline some things uh, but our volunteers are working really hard we have people who are jumping on left and right um, to help out. So it we really couldn't do it if it wasn't for the generosity of all of these folks at the moment. And 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 how are you needing to, because I'm sure you don't want to, but how are you needing to restrict uh, your volunteers? What what are the criteria uh, by which you are deciding, hey, you can take somebody on who's who's, who's wanting to get involved for the first time, or you know, having that maybe difficult conversation or communication with some, you know, with folks to say, you know, we can't use your help right now. Yeah, um, in the first uh, few weeks of this, we actually decided to not take on new volunteers. Um, and that was a, a decision made because we needed to figure out um, how we could even manage the volunteers we were doing safely. So we spent time coming up with safety protocols and waivers that folks are signing. Um, a policy around quarantining, if folks get sick, a notification policy. Once we got those in place, we started reopening it. Um, but it's, it is a, a bit of, there's so many folks who want to volunteer, which is great, um, but we don't really have room necessarily for everyone. So we're trying to find um, small ways to get people involved now so that as different folks can no longer volunteer, we can bring in new people. Um, so our volunteer coordinator Alex has been hard at work on kind of making, balancing that. Uh, the big thing though, is we encourage all of our volunteers to really take stock of if they or someone that they regularly interact with is considered high risk. Um, we, we trust them to make those decisions, but we consistently um, reinforce that to make the decision not to be volunteering right now, to stay at home is actually um, one of the kindest and best things you can a be doing. service, right, right. Yes. Yeah, it's that's a tough one, right? Because people really do <laughs> want to do something. We all want to do something, and you guys are, you know, high profile um, around here as a as a place. You know, if somebody was sitting around not having, you know, either had the time or the energy or the ability to con contribute to their community uh, until now, and the circumstances are fine and they're feeling good, um, you know, I bet that. Foodlink's going to be one of the first places uh, that they call. Um, so <clears throat> that's a, again, uh, you were mentioning, Deanne, the word nimble. And, and I, I think you also are demonstrating it in that context as well, where you're really having, just as you were saying, at least just now, um, you know, keep, keep folks, have some folks on the, on, the, on the bench there who are, have something to do until they have an opportunity to do more than that. Um, and uh, again, it's, it all sounds like a very delicate balancing act while you're moving fast, um, you know. Um, so well done. Um, quickly, what, I mean, you just touched on a couple of things, Elise, but um, I am sure that people who are tuning in um, are interested to know what they can do or what can be done for help and what it is that you guys could use, if anything, um, from folks who might be watching. So are there any answers to that? So, so um, there's several things that we've directed people um, as, as possibilities. One is making um, face masks, cloth face masks. And Laura's sewing school has a very good video on making sewing and uh, making these masks and sewing them. And what I've told folks or asked folks that if you don't sew, find a buddy who does sew and you can cut the fabric and they can do the sewing and make it a team effort. So that's one way. On our website, we have a list of cleaning supplies that we could utilize and 
other items, some, this may sound simple, but paper bags, so that we have a place where they go and they, they're quarantined, where people drop them off, all these items, and they're, they're quarantined for five days before they're put to use, because the distributions now, uh, nobody has choice pantries, they have to pack the, the bags up. So we're collecting some for Arlington Eats and other programs that we're working with. So that's one way to help. So where, where could people, or where should people drop that kind of thing off? Yep. So there's two set times and a set location at High Rock Church on Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. But it's not just drop it off, because if it's dropped off randomly, we will not accept it. It'll end up getting um, uh, uh, disposed of. But if they go on our website, it gives the the information that's needed. It's a Monday from four to five and Fridays from noon to one, but there's a very specific location that they need to be brought to and just dropped off. If there's a table, it's obvious, people just drop it. So there's little interaction and then somebody pops out every like 10 minutes to see what has come and then they, they bring it inside for quarantine. And we're requiring people to uh, label everything that they've given us with their name email address and phone number because we need to ensure that it's a decent quality and anything by folks put, giving us this information. And if we're getting like a bag, bags that were in somebody's basement and they're moldy and stuff that we cannot use those. Mm -hmm. And that way we, it, it, it. Yeah, if you need, right. plus if you need to follow up for whatever reason, then you'll yeah. have a chance to do that. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot of the information that you would want people to know if they want to be helpful is available on the website, is accessible. So just remind us again what the website is. It's www.foodlinkma.org. So no, it's foodlinkma straight through. Straight through. All yes. right. Great. And at least did you, I, I just wanted to, you don't have to, but I just wanted to, to give you an opportunity also to respond to that. You know, what can people do to help? Yeah, um, I think Dan covered some very immediate things folks can do. I think also spreading the word right now um, and kind of raising awareness of some of the work we're doing and some other folks are doing on food and security is really important. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, food and security is growing increasingly here. Um, and I'm personally very concerned about folks knowing how to access um, food resources during this time in the emergency food system, especially folks who have never had to do that. And that it's a, there is, there's a lot of stigma around going to a food pantry or asking for help. Um, so I think if we can start spreading the word that that is not something you should feel bad about right now, we all could use a little generosity and kindness. Um, in this time, I think that goes a really far away. Um, so talk about what we're doing and talk about what our partners are doing would be one of the big things I'd point to. And also donate. Um, we could certainly use financial assistance during this time. <laughs> <laughs> there is probably no time in which that <laughs> wouldn't be yeah. useful. Um, and, um, and, and clearly, I think, and people have figured it out because you know food link is not just a popular but i think a well supported uh resource here in town and that is not to say again that there isn't you know use for more money to come in at all times but i am i'm glad personally to know how many people are both aware of the organization and supportive in some direct way uh, of it so my last question is um is that I'm wondering how the changes that have been brought about because of the of COVID-19, the changes to the way that you, <clears throat> you know, perform um, your operations. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything in there that you've had to do simply in the face of this that you have found is going to be useful enough or uh, in some way you, f you, you want to take into the future when we get, assuming we do, to the other side of this? Um, I can start on that one. Uh, 
there's there's a lot we're learning about the work we do in this time. And I think one of the biggest things is working with wholesale distributors. Um, we have been really excited about that prospect for a long time. That's one of the, the things we're planning to do in our new building at 108 Summer Street is be able to work with trucking companies, wholesalers when they have excess product, which is something we do on a small, we were doing on a small scale. We are now doing that on a very large scale and building those relationships is gonna be invaluable for our future. Um, and it's, we're learning a lot about it and a lot about how um, our inventory management goes um, with that because this is stuff that we often have a longer shelf load on, which is um, really great. It makes our lives a little bit easier, but it's a different thing than we've had to do before. So I to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And, and I'll add to that is that one of the things that we've been investigating auxiliary cold storage and how that might uh, look like because if this were to happen again we'd be able to pivot even that much faster to get even more cold storage because even though we'll have 300 square feet of cold storage in our space at summer street that would not be that would not have been enough in the several weeks ago and so one of the things is that being innovative on accessing cold storage so that you can have the capability to collect this food and often you can wait a week on it when it's coming from warehouses and so then you can store it and then very thoughtfully distribute it to many organizations and helping many different people yeah i think it's you know uh, it's a wonderful thing deanne that you guys are thinking uh not only about you know again once normal operations resume how you can you know put into practice the lessons you've learned but also the next time something like this happens you know that you're actually also thinking realizing how important what you do is in times of emergency and in, in an emergency that none of us could ever have imagined i think uh we all would agree with that it turns out that food link is absolutely pivotal and the work that you do is more important than ever um, we have spoken uh, in recent weeks with a lot of people um, about the fact that the pandemic um, and the response to it has in a lot of ways uh, exacerbated existing inequities in, in our society. It is good to know, I think also, that it also has exaggerated the importance of really great service organizations such as yourselves um it, you know on the on the bright side uh we know that there's a lot of darkness um that we're all dealing with now so it's uh, it's it's nice to to come up with some silver linings in there as well um i want to thank you both and just invite you quickly if there is anything that we haven't covered that you feel like we should should be mentioned i just wanted to give an open invitation to bring that up uh, before we sign off um there's one thing i'd like to bring up is the number of people that we touch on regular terms it's about 20,000 over 20,000 people that are touched through the programs we serve and Elise could probably talk to this more but I suspect even though we're not serving a, a particular group because many of these places have closed we have opened us up to many other places and I suspect that number is similar. And what, one other thing I'd like to, to mention as well is that we're working with a couple of programs that are, are that we are going, we're seeking assistance from, and they're making it very easy for us. And then I realize how we get a reaction when a new agency wants to come on board or get food that we make it very simple for them. And I, often they're surprised at how simple we make it. And I'm understanding now their feeling of how we make it simple for them because some of these organizations that we're working with to provide us some services have been similar and it's been such a relief because we have also talked to several places that has not been easy to work with and Put up a lot of roadblocks so i understand now why these recipient agencies just they like sort of relax and they go is 
that's all we have to do to start working with you? And we say, yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's again, you know, one more piece of good news, as I was saying, which has been uh, in all too short supply um, recently, but that's, that, that's great. Um, Lise, anything to add or? Yeah, um, I will we'll, uh, kind of echo Dan. We are, I know we're doing well over what we normally do um, as far as folks serve, because one agency that we're working with, the Mystic Community Market, opened just a few weeks, maybe a month before this all occurred. Um, is currently serving 20,000 individuals, which is just mind boggling. Um, but the last thing I would add is it's actually Volunteer Appreciation Week um, while we're recording this. And I just want to say thank you to our volunteers and to the folks who are volunteering um, throughout the area right now, working on these issues. I know that um, despite how dark these times are, I don't actually have a lot of room to sit in that, that darkness because I am surrounded by these people who are just giving so freely of their time and energy and love to one another. So I just have to say thank you to our volunteers while I'm on this. <laughs> well, what a fabulous way to end an episode of Million Dollar Gift. Um, mm -hmm. I couldn't have said it better and I won't try. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Elise Springle and Deanne DuPont from Foodlink. Um, remember, go to their website, find out what it is that they could use help out as best you can, but everybody just stay safe. Guys, continue that excellent work that you're doing. We appreciate it so much. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk to you again when things are back to normal. Um, so best of luck until then. Stay safe and healthy. I'm James Milan. You've been watching Million Dollar Gift. We'll see you next time. Thank you.